Welcome back to the Inner Sanctum Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Julian Gill, and I'm back with Andrew Scambatti to discuss a whole bunch of videos from the archive, some of which have become legitimate over the years, and some of which are not. Um, Andrew, this is our final episode of this first season. Yeah. So why? Well, I mean, when we, we've been talking about doing a show like this for quite a while, and I wanted it to be different than any of the other podcasts that either I've seen or that you and I have done. I wanted to treat it more like a, a TV show. I know it sounds silly, but we kind of, when we had the idea about doing this, we picked 10 shows or, or 10 episodes uh, that doesn't include the, uh, the the promotional episode that we did for Madison Square Garden 77, but we picked 10 episodes that we wanted to do. We wanted to do these, put them out and see how well they do. And if people want more, we'll, we'll come back for more. So we've been at this for at least 10 weeks at this point. And um, so this will be quote unquote season one. And maybe if people want to hear us talk about unofficial or official kiss performances, we'll do, we'll do a season two, maybe season two will be all on audio shows that are only available on audio, like demos and, and other things like that. Cause I know you're a big audio guy. I'm a big video guy. So for now, this will be it. But I think we saved the best one for last, in my opinion, as far as the amount of information, as far as the amount of official corrections. So today we're going to go all the way back to January 1976. And on this episode, we're going to talk about all three nights at Cobalt Hall, January 25th, 26th, and 27th. All right, be sure you wanted the best and you got it. The hottest band in the land! Yeah! Uh, we've decided to combine all three nights because, you know, there's a lot of similarities between the three. And I didn't feel as though that doing an episode on each one of these three nights was going to go over well. It would have had a lot of repeated content, a lot of repeated things. So, so for now, we're going to go through all three of these shows on this last show, and this will be the... The season finale, not the series finale, but the season finale. So, uh, and we hope you guys enjoyed all all eleven of these shows now. And uh, if you guys want more, we'll we'll come back and, and do more. Yeah, what a great way to end the first season because these are such an important group of shows for fans, mm -hmm. and to a certain extent, they've got a little bit of a legendary uh, kind of cachet because there have been bits and pieces that we've seen over the years. And this yeah. goes back decades, decades. Um, you know, prior to Kissology legitimizing parts of them. Um, but th they were teased and they were some of the best looking and sounding, in my view, of the really old performances um, you know, going back to my first experience. So uh, how many times have these clips from these shows turned up and oh, you man. Know, walk, walk us through some of the various ones that have been available historically? <laughs> oh, man. So this, this, I put this list together a couple of years ago and I've consistently been refining this list because, yes, these shows, they've been teased everywhere. Um, some of the earliest known bootlegs that were being traded were, were some of these shows. So uh, the first thing I, I kind of want to I kind of want to kick it off um, with January 25th. And there is, in addition to the pro shot footage that we're going to talk about, there's also uh, a 25, 26 minute black and white footage that was shot by we think it was shot by Chip Rock, but it has some backstage footage. And then it's shot from, I believe it's the soundboard. And uh, we first became aware widely about this. We first became aware of this during the uh, VH1 special Ultimate Albums Kiss Alive. That's when we first saw our first little tease of this, and then it leaked into fan circles later on. But this is something cool. You get to see like what the audience saw at that point in time. You know, Just remember, there wasn't cameras in everybody's pockets at this point, and there wasn't even home video cameras at this point either. So um, to see basically a fan shot version of this, I thought was kind of cool. So uh, yeah, so black and white, it's about and you get to see the screen. Yes, you get to see that the was in use and the whole yes. reason for filming the show to show it on that big screen. But it bothers me that that 25 minutes is very partial. It's a bit choppy in between the songs. So some of them are not complete. Mm -hmm. You only get little tastes of 
what is it the blood spitting yeah um i think you get the one of the fireballs um you know so it, it's it's very partial but it's a, a it's a good taste and teaser from distance very similar obviously i think to uh what was it keel st louis Seal 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 later Seal in, Seal Seal later Seal. in the year in terms of being distance but we don't know uh, black and white we don't know how this was shot what kind of camera was he using so maybe he was only able to shoot little bits at a time we don't know we don't we don't really know um things like that uh in addition to this there is a silent eight millimeter footage from i believe the 25th and the 26th um and you get to see you know other pieces of the show so i've never been able to track down like incredible versions of this footage but if you look hard enough you could find it it's uh it is silent and uh, it is uh lossy so there weren't proper scans done on it so uh but there is it's just additional footage from 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 the night so uh um, at least there's the real audio to match up with it if right. they ever do if it gets into the right hands and a proper scan is done of that original super 8 media it could be spectacular married with the audio from the video oh. and just give a different perspective on it yeah. i have a big problem watching uh you know eight mil footage i doesn't do a lot for me me neither um, usually yeah. be usually because historically the transfers haven't been great and they've improved over mm -hmm. the last few years you know obviously with tools and skills um and care and effort that's gone into a lot of those things yeah 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 so uh, let's just let's just jump right into the show um this january 25th because we're just going to jump into the shows because there's a lot to talk about with each show well, before you do, can I just set a little bit of historical context yes. about what was going on yes. um, as as the group arrives in Detroit and obviously the Michigan area? They did a show in Erie, Pennsylvania, on I think the twenty third, and they had just finished recording Destroyer. You know, most of the sessions were complete by that time. So this really is, you know, they're on the cusp. They're in the middle of following up the Alive album. Um, and in the very week that they are in Detroit, Alive is back in its high position of number nine on the Billboard album charts. And Rock and Roll All Night, the group's first real hit single um, hits its high point of number 12 on the Billboard singles chart. So uh, there's a lot of different pieces coming together at this time, and there's a lot of press and rehearsal and everything set up around it at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, this was this was their unofficial official homecoming because prior to this, they had played Detroit in May of 1975, which famously were, was where the main tracks from Kiss Alive were recorded. But this is this was their first this was their first real taste of legitimate success of being not only um, a platinum selling band which they were presented with the platinum awards this first night but multiple nights in a legitimate arena. Cobo Hall was the first arena that Kiss played as a headliner back in May 60s, 1976, 1975. I'm sorry. So this was like an unofficial homecoming. I know Kiss is not from Detroit, but they always hailed Detroit as kind of the first city that caught on. So uh, have you ever heard anything from the press conference? Never, never. Because that sh that took place on the afternoon of the 24th, 24th after yeah. they arrived from Erie. Um, and I don't think I've ever heard a thing. And mm -hmm. I'm, I do think um, that it is, it does exist. Mm -hmm. I'm nearly certain that it, it did, but I may be conflating that with the destroyer press conference. And there's the Japanese press conference too, from 77. Yeah, and I, I strictly mean for 76 stuff that oh, I do okay, know, okay. Uh, have heard whispers of. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So um, I want to kind of, I want to section off how we're going to talk about the show. Because the first thing that I want to do is, as we mentioned, it's, this show is one of the, these shows have been all over every, every release. That's going back to Kiss Exposed, Kiss Extreme Close Up, Kiss Confidential, Kiss My Ass. And I just pulled out a promotional copy of Kiss Confidential, so that's was cool. It's also on Kiss that I had never seen. Hold that up again. I want to see that. I, it's I've never seen one. It's of those. nothing. It's nothing. Even like it's just just a silly like a silly just regular box, and it's just regular tape with a stamp on it. Oh, nice. No, that's that's cool. Again, I haven't seen it, so thank you. You've made my day. I've seen I've something new. Never, 
Oh, and look, and if I look, if so, it's hard to see. But if I if I tilt the tape, there are some serial numbers, and it does say one zero six one seven Kiss Confidential is printed on the actual tape. Hmm, it's kind of cool. I guess I'll have you watch- transferred it to see if it's different. No, I never watched it. I guess I have to now. I've I've never opened this. By the way, this is my kiss my ass. That's because this yeah these all of these tapes these have, aside from Kiss Exposed all these tapes they have definitely been played quite a bit, quite a bit, and then obviously I have them all on DVD. Uh, yeah, my most worn obviously is the one that means the most to me. Mine would be this. So sorry to distract you. Mine would be this. Um. Anyway. Um. So on, on all these releases. Almost every single release gives the wrong date for these Copa Hall shows. Almost every single one. Going all the way back to to Kiss Exposed. So let, let, let's go over that. Let's, let's correct all those dates first. because Okay, so on Exposed, they've got Strutter, right? Um, well, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go in order of the tape. I'm going to go in order of the show. Because the way I have my notes, it's my notes are by show. So, um, starting with January 25th, the 100,000 years and the awards ceremony excerpt, they both appear on Kiss Confidential and they're labeled as 12676, when in actuality they're 12576. Um, going on to the second night, January 26th, the bass solo and 100,000 years is on extreme close up, and that's mislabeled as Cobalt Hall 1975. I don't know why they did that. Deuce, the Flame and Firehouse, Black Diamond excerpts are also on Extreme Close Up, also mislabeled as Cobalt Hall 75. <laughs> Lastly, Hotter Than Hell, which appears on Kiss Confidential, is mislabeled as 12576, when in actuality it is 12776. So those are all the correct dates on all the official releases. There are additional releases that have Cobalt Hall clips on them but those are all the strictly the mislabeled ones and i believe it's every single time they set a date it was wrong so from all of these archival vhs's that we've just uh, held up Uh are all three shows represented clips from all three yes yes because i remember back in in the trading days when i got the video i had the 25th and the 26th and i don't think the 27th circulated for quite a long time correct and there was always a lot of guessing going on around that one that the, there were quality issues blah 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 there were all these problems with it and obviously a lot of people were talking from a point of ignorance maybe a couple of people were talking from a point of fact mm-hmm. um, so, so that was always my assumption that the 27th was kind of the unicorn it looks the best <laughs> surprisingly hands down looks the best um, yeah that was one of those shows back in the early trading days there was Copa Hall night three there was the complete Houston 76 um the complete Roosevelt Stadium 76. Those were kind of the, the worst kept secret, like uh, non-circulating shows. Everybody knew that those existed at some point, and no one just could ever get their hands on them until much, much later. I mean, I didn't get a copy till like 2008 or 2009. And, um, you know, there were clips appearing in 2010 of the third night, but it had a time code on it. Um, which is kind of one of those things that just that plagued a lot of the the early the early trading days. They had time codes on them, so it was there. Like Deuce was uploaded in 2010 from the third night, um, and that just kind of was, you know, one of those things that it, when the great leaks started, that was one of the things that started to leak out. But the third night, we knew it existed. It was just kind of the worst kept secret for a really, really, really long time. But yeah, all three nights are represented on uh, on all these archival releases. And um, just going over to, because I know we talked about the VHS ones, but going over to the Kissology, in the main feature of Kissology, there's there's Night 2. Uh, did you go to see when they did that, when they had the um, Night 2 in uh, the movie theater, uh, Halloween 2006? No, and I don't remember what my excuse for not doing my homework that day was. I, I don't believe that in San Francisco there was a cinema showing it, or it would have involved hopping in the car and going down the peninsula. To me, which would have been a pain in the backside uh, on a work night. 
uh, especially with my son at that age. I didn't go only because I was seeing Paul's Live to Win tour. That's the only reason why I didn't go. Because the same night as the Live to Win tour was in New York City, so I didn't go. So well, That's a good excuse. Yeah, so I missed it. I had a poster <laughs> forever, and I don't know where the poster ended up, but... Um, it's gone now, but but yes, yeah, so they showed that in theaters to promote Cosology Volume One, Halloween 2006. Um, the very first night, missing the encores was the Best Buy bonus disc for Cosology Volume One. So um, we talked about the third night didn't initially circulate, and then the complete first night also didn't initially circulate. It was always missing the encores. I don't even know why. Never found out why. It wasn't until uh, 2022 that the very full show of January 25th and the full show of January 27th without the time code began to circulate. Yeah, I lose track of all of those things. That's why I have my notes. I was just about to say, did everybody get into that? Everybody got that? I just saw I just saw Spaceballs at the drive-in and there's that scene where they're they're watching the movie and they're like, uh, when did that happen? Now? Just now? What about then? We just missed it. When? Just now. Everybody got that? So that's what I feel like when we're talking about these shows. I'm like, everybody got that? So um, just take, uh, go back to Kissology for a yeah, moment. Yeah. Um, is there Paul and Jean commentary? Oh, there that is. Section? There is. You know, I always forget about the commentary on these and i haven't listened to that in so long you're right about that i totally forgot about that it's not they don't talk it's not like a director commentary on a movie they have little commentary sections and there's just like little like little minutes here and there like you'll turn the con the commentary track on then every couple minutes gina paul will say something then you'll hear the song then gina paul will say something so i i remember listening to the commentary on volume three and it's the same on kind of all the volumes. So it's not throughout the whole show. They're not talking throughout the whole show. There's like a, there's an intro. Then like they come in, they peppered in here and there. But yeah, I totally forgot about that. Yeah. And then I, th wasn't there a Kissology special on one of the channels? That's correct. Um, there were two Kissology specials. There was a Kissology special. Ooh, why is there balloons? <laughs> um, it's hand, hand gestures. It, there were two Kissology specials. Um, one for Kissology Volume One. It was called Hanging With, and it was hosted That's by right. Eddie Trunk. Um, that was on. Uh, it was around the same time, Halloween 2006. So that was actually pretty cool because they were right? talking about that. Um, I also remember that they did a special for Kissology Volume Two, and what was so cool about that is that was the first time that we saw clips of Detroit 1990 in that mint quality. I just remember losing my mind. I couldn't wait to get Kissology Two when I saw how good Detroit 1990 looked. Um, Losing your mind to Detroit 1990, Rock City. I was, yeah, I was. There was no special for Kissology Volume 3 because VH1 Classic, they showed, they had like an all-day Kiss marathon. They, they kept repeating the same like five Kiss shows just all day for 24 hours. You know, much like Kiss, where, hey, you don't have these songs in this order, so let's just watch the same show just for 24 hours over and over and over and over again. So that's why there was no special for um, Kissology Volume Three. So um, well, I'm bummed because I, I should have dug out Hanging with Kiss to watch beforehand. So there we go. They're they're fluff I'll pieces. Survive. Yeah, they're fluff pieces. There's not really there's nothing really in them that you go, oh, that's that's interesting. It's the same because remember it was shot in 2006. It was like that insufferable period for Gene and Paul, where like everything they said was just like I was just I always groaned. Um, it was like the tail end of Gene's asshole era. Yeah, I know the ass album came out in 2004, but like he had that same kind of candor throughout those couple, couple of years. And I just remember everything he said. I was just like, oh, I couldn't listen to him. Uh, but then he got a little bit more humble and like Family Jewels came out and everyone was just making fun of him. So that humbled him a little bit. But there was a point in time where it was very hard to listen to those two guys talk. It's very hard. Anyway. All right. All right. So. All right, so back to let's let's go back to night one. So we've we've corrected all the dates of all the official releases, but there's other notes in in each shows, and each shows do appear other places. Um, so I I do I kind of want to talk about those. I want to talk about what makes each night um, different. So right, because I know a lot of times you'll get just a disc and they'll just say Kobo seventy six. You may not know what night you're watching. 
So um, I've just kind of made little bullet point notes uh, for each night here. Um, so for the first night for, for January 25th, you know you're watching because Paul knocks over the mic during Strutter. Um, and the only time throughout these three nights, Ladies in Waiting is played uh, on the very first night. So that's those are kind of two call outs that happen um, in, in that in that first show. So the for the second show, January 26th, it's obviously, a com- well, mostly complete. It's around 99.999% complete. There's like a section of strutter that's missing. There's like, it's the same on Kissology Volume 1. It's just, just a little piece of strutter missing. So that always annoyed me. Um, but Parasite replaces Ladies of Waiting. Um, then the third night, Parasite remains. Initial copies of the third night circulated with the time code, so it was easy to tell that that was the third night. And the encores didn't circulate till 2022, much like the encores for the for the first for the first show as well. Um, the the version of the shows that we reviewed to to look at this were the same shows that we purchased from that Japanese website back in 2023. The first thing that I noticed when watching the encores for night three, it's super clear that it was a different source for the encores you're watching the main part of the show everything looks like it's very clear probably came from the one inch or the two inch tape and then it's very very clear to me that the encores came from a vhs it lacks that detail it lacks sharpness and it's it's step it's a low generation vhs probably first or second generation but absolutely if you're watching it if you're watching that show in one sitting you could absolutely tell that it was a different source for those encores yeah, different scan. It's pretty pretty obvious. Yeah, you know that there's there's something different about it. Mm-hmm. But you know what? It doesn't ruin the experience. No, One not thing at all. That's really surprised me about this when you put this up as being our, our final episode of this first series. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh shit, I got to watch three of the same show. Mm-hmm. It's not though. It really it really isn't, and it it's it was really it's not often with video because I'm just I don't have the brain that can handle comparing videos mm-hmm. that I, I I threw these into a, a photo editor uh, into a, a a movie editor and I A B C them um, one song after another splitting it up so that I could focus it and it really it actually turned into a very fun four and a half hour um, experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did you notice about the first night? Like just in in, in, in what sense? Visually, what did you notice about the first night visually versus the other two nights? Um, because there's something a, there's something in there that isn't really apparent in the other nights. I I don't know. So uh, annoying. You'd have, you'd have to tell me. Those annoying split screens are. Oh yeah, they're, super, yeah, they're in my notes. They're super apparent in the first night, but they are. They they do show up in other nights, but I I I think my notes, and we'll talk about it when we're talking about the songs, mm-hmm. um, is that I'm like, this is not a good use of split screen technology. They're focusing on the wrong um, the the wrong thing at the wrong time mm-hmm. so i think i was thinking in a a solo during a song they were focusing on gene and paul so weird or so weird it, it, it was just a little bit off kilter in, in that sense okay yeah i agree all right so we've talked about kind of the the main notes of the shows we've talked about the date corrections of the shows um so now that they these shows appeared other places and the dates were not wrong so for example um let me go rock and roll. There's an excerpt for that that appears on Kiss Confidential. They just kind of said Detroit 1976. They were like, we don't know where this comes from, but it comes from Detroit 1976. Uh, it's the same for Kiss My Ass. So on Kiss My Ass, they pulled from, they did Come On Love Me, She, and Black Diamond from the third night. So it it's apparent to me that when they were putting together Kiss My Ass that the band favored the third night over any of the nights because the third night is the one that was used most throughout all those archival releases. Yes, when they used it on a Kiss Extreme Close-Up, they mislabeled it, Colbo 75. But out of all of the... Oh, and sorry, Strutter is on Kiss Exposed. That's also from the third night. So when you look when you look at the third night, Deuce, Strutter, Firehouse, Black Diamond, Hotter Than Hell, Come On and Love Me, and She, all from the third night, appear all across those videos. That's more than any of the other nights. So the band favored that third night 
at least that, that makes it it makes it pretty weird that we waited so long for it in collector circles mm -hmm. it, it's counterintuitive to a certain extent that there's so much of it out there officially mm -hmm. and that the whole thing didn't leak it didn't it took a long time for it to leak a long time um the last thing I want to kind of mention on this one, then these were when these were being initially traded. Initial bootleg VHS copies of Night One included the the encores from Largo seventy five. You know, the other show that only the encores circulated for years and years and years and years and years. Um, so I know sometimes when I got a tape, you had Cobalt Hall, and then the encores were just spliced in from Largo seventy five to make it feel like a full show, whatever have you. So I got I got a hand to a lot of bootleg dealers at the time. You know, it was fifteen dollars for a VHS tape, and I kind of always felt like I got my money's worth. I never I never paid a lot of money for a VHS tape and was disappointed by it. So uh, now we're, we're disappointed all the time because we don't know what's on a reel or we don't know what's on something. We pay all this money, then we watch it, and we go, yeah, that really wasn't worth it. But I tell you, whenever I bought VHS tapes, it was always worth it. I always got my money's worth. Yeah, those mistakes could be a lot more expensive these days. Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, so we've kind of gone over like like these these long, um, you know, high level views of the shows. What do you remember about the shows? About the, your first time watching these? Was your first time Kissology, or had you seen them before? I had VHS um, of I think the first two nights mm -hmm. um, prior to Kissology, and. Both of those were so generated and the colors were just less than spectacular that they were sort of a one and watch. And I went back to the audio versions that I had, I, you know, had gotten through trades uh, as well. Mm -hmm. They just weren't something that really captured my attention. Um, the appreciation for them only really came in the years following Kissology when some better looking versions than what was on Kissology in terms of color um, and, and some of the post prod type stuff that just ruins a lot of the things on Kissology um, became available. That's when it really made a difference, but it was only again because of Largo 75 uh, coming out in its totality and my reaction to that, that I really had to revisit these and reevaluate why I didn't find them as exciting as I did uh, earlier on in the tour. Yeah, I mean, I hate to sound like a broken record, but you know, going back to Kissology Volume 1, I was excited that I was going to have the best version of Cobol Hall 76 on Kissology Volume 1, and that just wasn't the case. You know, there's a little piece of strutter missing and it's just it's very dark and it just doesn't look good. You know, when all of these shows started leaking out from that, from that Japanese website and we got to see them in so much better quality, I was so shocked. I was like, what was the band doing at this time? I mean, what what happened with with Kissology? Why was it? Why did it feel like it was such an afterthought that everything was rushed? And, and well, or did they, or did they review and approve versions of those shows that weren't as dark, or are they going blind? Because <laughs> the, it wasn't the only show; it was a a theme of a lot of the archival shows where colors were off. Yeah, um, but tell me, tell me why everything looks so good and exposed and doesn't look good on Kissology? Tell me why. Resolution. I don't know. Exposed came out in 1987. And kiss all yeah, but you know the technical specs of VHS versus the technical specs for DVD, and the expectation for the for visual appeasement in 2007 is far different than in the 90s or the or or 87 when you know we're we're begging for an eyeful but we only get a peak type mentality. So by 2006. When something's coming out officially on DVD, or it would be the same on Blu-ray today, uh, were that even still a thing, um, I would be expecting, you know, crystal clear almost mentally before thinking common sense about the original source material and how that can be transferred to digital. Well, you know, Kissology says, here it is, everything you wanted in one box, remastered and restored. Pish pot. It's Kiss saying it. It's this Kiss is, saying it. Come on. Not remastered and restored. It's just, it's, I can't, 
I always go back to everything looked so much better in 1987 versus how it looked in 2006. And it should have been the other way around. It should have been the other way around. You know, maybe, maybe in a future episode, we'll talk about Houston 77, how awesome that looked unexposed and how shitty it looks on Kissology. Just shitty. So shitty. And then later on down the line, you know, fans like myself, you know, we get a hold of, you know, different versions of the show, you know, especially from the Japanese website that we like to talk about so much better than what was on Kissology. So it's just, it's a shame. It's a shame that, 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 that it came out that way. So the only thing I hope is that the original source tapes for these still exist somewhere somehow and haven't been transferred and disposed of as universal was doing you know long ago throwing out dumpsters full of stuff uh, happened to all coin tapes as well mm -hmm. you know going in the dumpster it, so that as historical artifacts they can be you know redone like universal is currently doing with the audio reels in iron mountain you know mm -hmm. taking them up to modern standards um as that progresses that's my only hope that one day we, we get to see something that really is uh, definitively first generation one for one transfer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we know that at one point, you know, kiss had these, they had to have had them. There was a promotion clip that was put out by a coin in early 1976. The use of this, we don't know. I mean, it was probably to you. It was probably being used to promote the band in other countries that, they couldn't see Kiss live, but but again, you know, we kind of got into this conversation a little bit on the previous show um, about the music video, this and that, and you know, we'll we'll talk more about that on a, on a later show, hopefully. But what was the purpose of this? This um, was it? It's like a twelve minute reel. What was the purpose of this? Do you know? I have no idea. I and do you, you want me to be completely honest? I didn't watch. I'd never seen that until preparing for this show. That's so weird. That's so weird. I remember I'm not, I, again, I'm not the video guy when I, it, you know, how it's labeled, it would just be like, so what, you know, it was only with purpose that I went in and, and this one on my notes, it's uh, all coin promo is mm -hmm. nice blend of the first and last night's backstage footage. Yep. Uh, so they, they combined that at the beginning, um, hard transition to firehouse, but only one flame, lots of crowd shots is what I noticed. So it seems they, they really compile that. And then it's uh one, two, three, four, five songs basically. So what is it? Well, I don't want to get into that discussion about um, promo clips, but it, I think it probably was used to that effect, similar to how Kobo 75 had been used, that it was a visual calling card rather than being a promotional um, clip to be played on top of the pops or any of those mm -hmm. um, kind of music shows back in the day or midnight special, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it served as a way to interface with promoters and other businesses and to visually upsell the band that's a guess but i have never seen it mentioned in paperwork i don't think i've seen any receipts uh from rocksteady for its production i've never seen any notes relating to the filming of these it, it's it's really weird there's still so much more out there but so here, here's what we do know about this we do know that it was produced by a coin of rocksteady and then it lists kirby kelly as the the people that filmed it so we know that later on there was an in-house camera crew at Cobalt Hall, but I don't think this was shot by in-house Cobalt Hall crew. This was shot by Kirby Kelly. So I think Kiss actually paid to have these three concerts shot for whatever reason. That's, yeah. That's that's what I think. Um, and and then just looking at that uh, that little promo, the promo that they put together, they had all the nights at some point in time because they're using stuff from the third night and they're using their and, and even there's little clips from the third night that even appeared on the second coming that came out in 1997 or excuse me 1998 I'm, I'm sorry november 1998 so they had all of this stuff at their disposal at some point in time so it, it makes you wonder why why was there such a terrible edit in shutter on kissology volume one why did the bonus disc of kissology volume one Cobo Hall and not include the encores. I mean, what happened? I mean, we heard rumors that, you know, the tapes were stolen. They were left in a limo, but they had them at some point. They had them at some point. So, and who knows what the ultimate goal was to be, uh, to use these for? Who knows? 
who knows so but we know that they did put this together and this is like i've had that that cobalt hall clip for man i couldn't tell you how for how long there was a there was a, a tape there was a couple compilations um one of them was called mishmash and the other one was called rare bits and pieces that i got from my friend gary danko at the rocketorium and this is on there so i was like oh well there's the alive promo which was this and then there was a live two promo. So it made all the sense in the world to me that they had a promo for every live album that, that they did. Uh, we know that judging by the TV clips that currently circulate that a live two promo was used all the time on the TV, all the time, every time they were on the news that a live two promo was being used so much, so much. So, um, but I've never seen TV clips currently that use this uh this cobalt hole promo so who knows what it was actually for uh i'm glad it exists and i'm glad that uh you know we're able to see it and we're able to enjoy it because i've always really enjoyed this i always thought it was something very very cool so if you know and have any memos or any other evidence that point to why it ex- why that promo um clip was constructed chime in wherever you've watched this because again we love to learn new stuff and discover the answers to our questions yeah 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 i'm always interested to like to to get paperwork and to to look at stuff and to just find out what happened or how this came to be i mean there are some clips that we know why they are the way they are we know that you know nhk shot budokan 77 we know that the houston shows were in-house ones so i'm always interested to know like where did this where did this come from because remember it was it wasn't as easy to film a band uh, back then that it is now a lot of planning, a lot of money. And uh, so, yeah, if someone has any information, always interested to look at those old memos from back then to see kind of where stuff came from, who paid for it, all this stuff. So, yeah. So last thought on that is, you know, in some of the, um, you know, Michigan press and, you know, rolling up to this, uh, the press conference that they basically announced that this was going to be the end of this type of format of show. So I wonder whether it's connected with that, that they wanted to have a good professional archive for the end of that first phase of their touring career. This was the culmination of the original homebrew kind of stage show. Why, but why? Why would they say that? Because, you know, let's just, I mean, they're in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, three days later, probably playing the same show. Um, yeah, but they're playing the same show three nights in a row at the what was their biggest market. Yeah. So as you said at the top, this was basically their homecoming. An official homecoming. And yeah, just to, to bring up another news item, you know, um, Detroit was the best KISS market, according to Casablanca Records in January 1976, that Detroit normally accounts for 2.5% of the national record sales. But when it comes to KISS... Detroiters make up nearly 6%. Hmm. Maybe that's why. Hmm. Because why else would they pay what would have been a, have to be a pretty, you know, decent amount of money to film three nights with a professional crew in that quality. And they were clearly prepared generally for those shows with cues. Well, generally, I mean, Gen- generally, generally, tell the cues, they became a lot better. Uh, towards the third night and it's just my opinion the third night that just looks the best there's the lighting is just so much warmer um it just it visually it looks the best out of all the colors of the lighting yeah. the texture of what we're watching for yeah. that night it, it is just a uh, even with the imperfections of the encores a, a wonderful viewing experience mm-hmm. yeah 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 it really is so anyway if anybody has any more information on on the uh the the history of these shows and how they came to be always interested in talking about that because yeah it's just it's fascinating to me just like it, we, there was there were so many chats about um what happened to all of the footage shot for the hotter than hell commercial whether that was that was supposed to be like a, a longer promotional clip so what happened to that so and just reading up on the memos and just reading just it's fascinating it's fascinating to just figure yeah, out there are, there were, were a few trade industry events in 74 75 that kind of makes sense for the hotter than hell being longer than it was because mm-hmm. we got the receipts for those promos mm-hmm. uh they were supposed to be at uh what was it uh is it ralph nader music expo in march 1974 and that they were going to be showing a 20 minute hmm. kiss multimedia video mm-hmm. so 
Right, back so to the show. So interesting. So interesting to to find out that stuff. So um Okay, so um I mean you mentioned your your initial thoughts on when when you first saw the show. Um I this was one of the original bootlegs I got, but I didn't get the first night for I couldn't tell you how long. Probably a good decade into collecting because I had the second night and at the time to me it didn't make sense like why do i need two of the same show i didn't realize that ladies in waiting was going to be played um on the first night but once once i knew the first night was not complete i was like i don't want that i wanted the the complete night so it was probably i probably got the first the second night in 1999 1998 and then it was probably probably a good decade before i got the actual first night. It was probably like maybe 2004, 2005, 2006 when I actually like sat down and got the first night. So like, oh yeah, it is. It is different. So um, because that's when like DVDs were just were starting to become a thing, and you know uh, that's that's when I that's when I got that. I just didn't. It didn't. As a kid with my allowance money being limited, it didn't make sense for me to have two of the same show. Just like when we were talking initially about um, Houston. Houston 77 the first night is darker than the second night so obviously I always was getting the second night so um so yeah as a kid I didn't it as a collector now shame on my child self but as a collector now um I have them but back then it didn't didn't matter to me I was like ah, two of the same thing what do I need that for so how many copies of love gun do I have now countless so um so yeah that's that's that was my that was how mine came to be uh, on video. So um, are you ready to jump in to the shows and, and kind of go show yeah. by show and just, I don't, I don't essentially want to talk about every single song of every show only because there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of overlap between these three shows because um, aside from some performance things and aside from some, you know, uh, song things, obviously Parasite replacing ladies and waiting these shows, um, the the meat and potatoes of these shows are similar. That's what I'll say. Yeah, go for it, because uh, I'll just interrupt you if I've got something to say. <laughs> You'll just interrupt me. <laughs> so um, we're gonna go all the way back to um, this is the very first night, January twenty fifth, seventy uh, second. And just remember, this is this is the the super call out of this show and this didn't initially circulate when the show first came in was that platinum award uh being given to them prior to um prior to playing uh, one of the encores so that was always the most interesting clip when that was on the the kiss confidential vhs if that was always something i always wanted to see that's how i knew that there was more than what was circulating out there so for me that was I always was just obsessed with that little piece of footage, seeing Kiss get those awards. So that was always the when the fir- when the full show finally started circling. I was always like, you know, really interested to get that. But starting at the top of the show, the opener of openers, uh, Deuce. What always um, stood out to me on this show was the logo rising from the back because we kind of take it for granted now that we could see it just by logging onto YouTube at any time. But the first time seeing it, seeing the logo rise up and going, oh yeah, that is that is something visual. That's something kind of cool. Heavy, heavy split screen work during during Deuce. Um, and it's a it's a it's a vicious performance, just a vicious, vicious performance uh, of this song. Oh, it's rough and raw, which is wonderful. Mm-hmm. But I, I love the perspective. And, you know, my notes obviously are similar to yours on this. Mm-hmm. You know, it's great to see that logo rising in that manner on the on that first night. Um, it's rough. But my notes also have that the split screens are completely distracting and I, and Ace musically is a bit low in, in the mix. Second night, you know, there are bum notes at the beginning. Um, it, it's a better mix. I actually have the second night as my favorite version of that. But. Yeah, me too. Me too. I always I always went to the second night because I, I thought it sounded the best. The other interesting point is even though these were done at the same venue by the same crew, each night sounds so much different than the night before. So you kind of wonder why that is. So um, they on their schedule, 
they have sound checks penciled in for each one of those days. So maybe there was a little bit of tinkering each one of those uh, those nights. There had to have been because they sound they sound different. Um, there's a little there's a clip on the second coming where they're talking about their four night stand at the garden where they say like the first night you're just you come in a little too heavy. Then the second night you're you kind of start to settle in a little bit. Uh, I never really got that obviously they were a lot younger here, but I never really saw any signs of the performance having too much gusto in the first night. And then them petering out on the previous nights, all three nights, they're really, really coming for the throat on you. Yeah. And at this time, who knows who was actually doing the sound checks? Maybe the actual group members only did it the first night. And then that was uh, a function of guitar techs and others, you know? So who knows? I, I, I'm just spitballing here. Who knows? Who knows? So then we move on to Strutter. As I mentioned before, Paul Nikes, knocks over his mic during Strutter. Um, and then we get to hear Gene, you know, sing so good. Um, the little pre-chorus of Strutter, which I, I always thought was really funny. Um, him knocking over that. Cause that, that never happened again after that. I mean, obviously when they went on later in their touring careers, those microphone stands, they were bolted into the ground on there and he, he you know he's even using them as props you know later on in life but um here it looks like there was just a microphone just there and he accidentally knocked it over so um i thought that was just i thought that was kind of funny to see that and it's also funny to see the other um angle of that in the black and white because you see it from afar and you kind of see them rushing to go pick it up i thought that was yeah you see the tech come running in ducking down picking it up which Mm -hmm. is great Mm -hmm. Uh, but that first night performance musically even with the little uh you know throwing gene to the lines to try and cover for paul vocally even back in 1976 Mm -hmm. um is really fun it's it's a really good performance um but where the hell is Ace? They, you know, again, more bad split screens. Um, one of the best camera work on that first night is actually Peter drawing the drum roll, his little uh, move. They capture it perfectly. And I always get off on that sort of uh, touch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's yeah. There, there are a lot of uh, them not shooting Ace during Ace's solos, which I was like, what's they would have had to have known. So, but anyway, uh, come on and love me is next. I, I really, really wished that they were still doing got to choose at this point. Uh, Cause that was always my favorite song. And it was always so cool hearing that third on kiss alive and so cool hearing it on the winterland show. So there is no, come on, there is no got to choose here. So well, but come on, love me is, is cool. It was, um, this is one of those songs that was kiss and, um, a kiss at their best is, is what I'll say. Um, I do really like the choreography moves during the during the final chorus where Gene and Paul are both backing up to the microphone, kind of tilting their heads back. I do thought that was kind of cool to uh, to see that. Yeah, first night they they do good work on the individual shots. They're starting to mix it up a lot more. Um, split Gene, uh, split screen with Gene on the chorus. They get perfect. Um, still no ace. Um, <laughs> night two is very glitchy, uh, you know, visually. Um, but night three, oh my goodness, with the lighting above uh, at the beginning, the colors and the angles and the motion, Paul at the mic, uh, Paul's animated on the mic third night. Um, great, great version. Third night's where it's at. His hair looks so much bigger on the third night. I don't know what it is. His hair looks just looks giant on the third night. And I noticed here that there's a lot more purple and blue lights on the third night than any. It just, I don't know. It just, it just it makes it look if if I'm going back to watch this show now that we have the full show, I'm watching the third night because it just looks it looks cool. And we got to remember, too, there wasn't a whole lot of lighting at this point in time, especially no front or back trusses. The first time Kiss was using full front and back lighting trusses wasn't until the Rock and Roll Over Tour on 70, uh, the, the winter of 76 into 77. So they just had a couple. They had those lighting trees. I think there was. I think there were six or eight. Uh, I don't know. I never studied it, but there was just those lighting trees and there were spotlights from the front. That's it. That's all they had. There wasn't a ton. There wasn't a ton of overhead lighting and certainly no front or back lighting trusses. So I wonder what changed why the lighting looks so much different on the third night versus the other two nights. So probably because it had two nights, two nights to, to dial it in. They go, well, let's try this. Let's turn this on. Um, 
So then we move on to, you know, Paul, this is the first time Paul's talking to the audience. Um, man, he's just yelling all three of those nights in between those songs. So when someone's like, hey, man, what happened to Paul's voice? I'm like, man, he's been yelling for 40 years, just literally yelling. Um, but then we move it to Hotter Than Hell, which is hands down my absolute favorite Kiss performance ever. My favorite, my favorite Ace solo ever. So I couldn't pick a favorite throughout these three nights of which Hotter Than Hell that I like because, man, if I could just listen to that song over and over and over again, that solo, I would. Yeah, well, Paul's off mic a lot the first night singing, so he's he's not getting quite back on time, so he's just a little bit out of sync. Um, you know, I, I like him shouting out, come on, destroy it. <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, that second night, but again, third night, just because of the colors, it's a solid performance. It's mm -hmm. probably the cleanest uh, performance of that song. I want to go back to something that you said about come on and love me yeah. that you would have loved to have had got to choose there. Yeah. As much as I love come on and love me, I, I want my cake and I want to eat it too. I still want it in the set, but I think got to choose before it would have been awesome. Um, yeah. Just a good point. I agree. Yeah. And you could see, you know, hotter than hell on a, Kiss Confidential. So, <laughs> um, so Hotter Than Hell goes right into Firehouse. Um, I think the flame is actually the best on the first night. I think they captured the best on the first night. That's what I think. Hmm. I disagree. Which one do you think is I, the best? Um, third night. Do you? Of course you do. Yeah. The, the flame, the, the flames are perfect in terms of their framing. Um, but they're not fully framed on the first night and on the second night, um, the second they only really get they have that weird zoom out. Is that, that's that one, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think so because, um, they, they kind of, the second flame isn't as good. So, um, that's on Gene, but you know what? He's the one who's got to spit that bloody fire every night. So I'm not going to throw any sticks at him. And talking about throwing sticks, Peter trying to throw his uh, drumstick night one during Firehouse and mm -hmm. <laughs> pouncing off. Uh, it, it, you know, again, it gives a humanity to the performance, knocking over mics, missing a drumstick, you know, trick. Um, but Firehouse for me is best the second night. Why did Paul have a firehouse with the number three on it when that was Peter Chris's lucky number? Uh, I've heard that it wasn't Peter's lucky number. I heard that the three was actually an ohm. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I never really looked into I never looked into the um, the significance of the firehouse three. Hmm. Do you know why? No, it wasn't rhetorical. Oh. Uh, yeah, I just don't know. I never, I never knew why. I never knew why. Sure. All right, someone tell me. Yeah, someone tell us, please. Please, we never knew why. Okay, so following this, we, we go into She. Hands down, the best performance is from the third night. And this is the one that's also on the Kiss My Ass video. Um, and then we got Ace's solo. It's so, it's so funny to see that he's doing this solo and there's like hardly any smoke. That come that comes out of that guitar because we're so used to seeing it billowing out of that guitar, and uh, we don't really see a, a whole lot of it here. And an interesting thing to note too, and this appears in all three of those nights, where there's like little cues during Ace's solo, and there's like Peter's hitting the drums in sync with him on certain little parts to kind of amp up some of the effects on there, which I thought was interesting. And I didn't, I don't recall it happening on uh, any other other videos that we watched. So I thought that was interesting. They had that little back and forth thing there. Um, I love this. I love the performance of this song. This song, this performance blows away collectively on these three nights. Blows away their performance on the minute special of of she, but um, but it's cool. And I really, I really dug the inclusion of the um, the let me know little ace solo lick thing there. Yeah, visually, it's very impressive. Uh, what they're trying to do at the beginning is Paul coming out of the darkness. Um, just two spots on him mm -hmm. playing the intro riffs to the song. They don't get it uh, right on third night, which is weird because it's definitely the best performance. Uh, mm -hmm. Third night, they've got a roadie running on state across the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't see what he was doing. Probably the cleanup um, of fire stump. Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe. No, he, he runs behind them. 
Hmm. So maybe it was to get something thrown on stage off. Uh, it doesn't matter. But the menacing poses on night three just go with the tone of that song so perfectly. Uh, visually, again, it's the most appealing. Um, but the jam is better, especially the bass sound on the jam second night. Mm -hmm. For Ace's solo, I'm with you on Where's the Smoke. I'm like, I'm like that's really? it. That's it. That's it. That's um, it. You know, and the first night's not actually very good at all. Um, second night's more fluid, you know, the, the smoke helps, but the camera angles are crap. And on the, the third night, uh, you get the rocket, which I don't remember seeing on the other two nights. I didn't. Um, it almost looks like something happened to that, to that guitar on the first night. Cause they are, he has that kind of that, that almost, it sounds like a false start almost on the first night. Um, so maybe there was just something wrong with, with the guitar. Yeah, I mean, come on, this was technical issues abounded when you're doing those sorts of things. And I think he was, uh, setting up his stuff for himself a lot at the time anyway. So it happens, but third night, it all comes together and looks great. I totally, I totally agree. So, uh, up next we have ladies in waiting on the first night and then parasite on, on the other two nights. Um, I, I love how ladies in waiting it went from ladies in waiting right into nothing to lose. I kind of wish they would have kept ladies in waiting uh, just because I don't know. I like the song. It's like just a two minute, just meat, potatoes, rock and roll song. I always liked it. I love the choreography at the end of the song. Uh, I love Gene's vocal um, shame on the spotlight guy that, you know, he, he misses almost the, the first have the first line before the spotlight actually gets onto Gene. It just lets you know that this wasn't, this was a, a high tech show at the time, but still like, Man, they couldn't get lighting cues right, and who knows if the worries were high at the time. Um, I don't know. For some reason, I just I have to really be in the mood to hear Parasite. I loved Parasite in Winterland, but here I would much rather have heard Ladies in Waiting. See, I don't like Ladies in Waiting segueing into Nothing to Lose. I love it. It leaves me feeling cheated. Um, ladies in Waiting first night really is missing one very important thing. Some horrendous graphic overlays. Oh yeah, because like it isn't Largo seventy five. Yeah, should have just flown in the guy from there. Um, you know, Parasite is great, but Night Two it's a poor intro. Night Three again is much better, just again because it, it visually matches up with the performance. But Parasite's a great song live. St you can still hear it live to this day by Ace. And I think is Gene doing that? Well, maybe. Still, it's still a super fun song, but you know what? We'll always go for the deeper cut, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my t my favorite time for Parasite was in 1992. It just sounds just just menacing as all hell on the Revenge tour. Well, that it, lineup just yes took it to a different level. Yeah, but even like when when you hear three fourths that lineup and they were doing it again, you know, I think I heard them doing the Rock the Nation tour, and then they did it. Um, they did it again a couple times, like around 2014, around the Las Vegas era. I just, I don't know, for some reason that Revenge lineup, I always, I loved hearing it by that band. That band was, that band was out to prove something. Yep. So, uh, nothing to lose is the next one. Um, personally, I don't really hear a difference between those those three nights. Our boy Peter Chris is rushing, especially during that cowbell intro. It's nice to finally see him on camera a little bit more because this is like his first vocal of the night. Um, but, um, but man, too fast. Too fast. Yeah, this is the first song where my notes say, good use of split screen. Uh, <laughs> you know, night one, you get a nice side view of Peter. And it shows more of the stage. It shows the setup. So visually, it's a nice mix from your usual close up and wide kind of mix. Um, night two is a rough performance where Paul sounds tired. There's not enough camera on Peter while he's screaming his heart out and the cameras on Paul and Ace. It, it, it's just annoying and it, mm -hmm. and it bugs me. And I think Paul breaks a string during the song, during that uh, second night. Uh, third night again. Peter's mic's too low. Um, Peter's got issues with his mic, uh, but it's got the Largo-like feel from you know the earlier concert. So mm -hmm. it, it really comes across great, especially when he looks over at the camera with a, a fantastic expression. So all comes together mm -hmm. night three. And the other interesting thing, because you mentioned those side shots, that's how that's like one of those things where the it, these side shots wouldn't have been there just for uh, an arena 
shooting their in-house using their in-house crew so you can tell that they brought in additional at least they brought in additional cameras additional crew to get those side shots because i don't recall there being similar side shots to that in detroit 77 where that was clearly an in-house job so um there's additional coverage of the stage getting those side shots which you see them throughout the whole performance uh, on all three nights so it's very interesting that 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 was included there so you had to wonder I mean, these are giant cameras and like what's going on side of the stage like you have your roadies trying to work you have these giant cameras getting in the way so i don't know that was just just a, just a thought of mine that i had um hundred thousand years um i think the blood is the best in the first night No, you don't think so? No, I don't. Because you like the third night. I know you like the third night, but I just he looked. No, like, you like the second night. Second night for me. Mm, um, it's interesting for the blood for the blood sequence. It's I think it's nicely framed, but the puke sequence is terrible. Um, <laughs> the the best part about the first night is his ending look is absolutely savage and demonic. Mm -hmm. um, plus, the camera captures it perfectly. So, and second night. Um, seems I think it was missing a bit on on the version I was watching, uh, but it starts with Gene already hunchbacked, so he's very much Quasimodo mode, and that just goes so well with what he's about to do. Yeah. Um, and and the and it's more his heaving action really comes across while well, he's convulsing in agony, going from the hunchback. Um, but the no, continue. But the third night, I took marks off because he doesn't do the single riff at the beginning that those notes mm. that he would he would usually do before doing. He goes straight into it. It's a little bit rushed. Um, yeah, because he's like I already done this for two nights. I just yeah, and and that was you know what what I say in my notes is meh. You know, rest except final demon look is vivid. You know, um, but overall meh. This tour and the Creatures of the Night tour, I thought they were the most visually and the most theatrical performances of the blood spitting creature story. Yeah. That the, the Quasimodo bell shining down on him and all that stuff. So these per, like when he's just like, there's not a, he's able to spit a whole lot of blood here, which was a misconception of the time because when you see them again in 96 or even in 79, like he's like, he's got a mouthful of blood. There wasn't a ton of blood here and he doesn't get a ton of it on him either. So it looks like it, probably was like thick and disgusting which is probably why he was hunched over and he's he's like drooling it out um i prefer when he gets it all over him that's why i think it looks the coolest so but um there's not a ton of blood here um and then during this song we have the uh the obligatory peter chris drum solo this the drum solo sounds the closest to the drum solo that he did on kiss alive obviously it was the same tour and I think that I think this was this was the very first heavy metal drum solo, and obviously John Bonham comes comes in you know as a runner up on this. But there's just something about the use of the flange, and there's something about the use of the cowbell. He's technically not the greatest drummer, but he's the perfect drummer for this band. And I think the drum solo over all three nights it showcases that that this guy was. He was a powerhouse at this point. He really, really was. He really was a powerhouse. Agree. Mm -hmm. And what happened? Um, first night and third night, they missed the flames for 100,000 years. They got it in the second night, but the first night and third night missing. They just miss them. No, the, the, they get two of the, three of the four on the first night. Um, second night, they get all of the flames. Yeah. And third night, they don't get any. Yeah, miss him. So, so weird. How do you miss? But them? for me, the, that reprise section, the first night, it just comes again. It comes out of the dark, and you have Paul silhouetted against Peter's beautifully lit, sparkling kit, mm -hmm. and it's just an incredible bit of visual theater. Um, you know, Paul Stanley, um, Daltrey. It, it's just it, it's just epic you know just for such a short thing i'm like whoa that was cool there's something that i didn't mention here because that this differs from the 
Largo 75. He was using just a regular, Peter was using a regular, just silver wrap drum set. But here he has what's commonly referred to as the kiss alive drum set, where it was the disco ball wrap, where it was like little individual mirrored pieces of this drum set that he had it for here. So I'd be interested to, to figure out when he actually started using that, the mirror ball drum set versus the regular silver one. Uh, but it's so nicely represented here. And that was probably my favorite Peter Chris drum set out of all of the drum sets that he used uh, in the seventies. So um, visually it's represented very, very nice here. Um, and it's just like, it sounds good. That's just, as silly, as silly and as simplistic as that, as that sounds. Um, these drums, they just sounded as a, you know, as a musician, those drums just always floored me. And it was always great to see them here. Uh, so now we're, we're going to move on to black diamond, um, which is, which is great. Um, Peter counting off, I believe it's the second night and I'm just going off a memory of this one just because that's I'm, I'm nuts like that. But I believe the second night you hear him break a stick when he's counting the one, two, three, you hear him, the stick break and you hear the piece of the stick hit the snare drum. Surprised you didn't hear him swearing then. <laughs> well, he just grabbed another, another stick and just continued on. But, um, man, the vocals that Peter gives during black diamond at this time period, it's just, it's feral. And it is um, a guy that has something to prove. Really. Third night. He's a madman. He is just a, a madman. And the other big part, it's not just his vocals during the song. It's like the, the Zeppelin jam section mm -hmm. of Black Diamond. Um, just fantastic third night. Angle on the drum kit rising. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Went up like that much. But the, everything, there was just like so many like bombs and stuff going off. And you didn't know that the everybody's so used to the drums going up like like they did in 77 because everybody's like, you know, Kiss Meets the Phantom. And then obviously, anytime the drums are going up, they wanted to replicate that look. But they don't go up that far on this, funny enough. And and let's remember, this is the first time the drums are going up at Cobalt Hall because the drums, they didn't go up in Cobalt Hall 75. They for some reason they just they didn't they didn't rise. Chain was broken, or the guy was too drunk to do it, or something was unplugged. But um, but yeah, so I think this is a it's a fitting end to the to the first part of the set. Really, really is, and they and a great performance done by done by all of them. What say you? First, yeah, uh, uh, again. Third night's where it all comes together. First two nights, uh, you know, you get the you get the concussions. It really is a nice, you know, main set closer. But I'm I'm just looking at the next song and just cringing about the first night. Cold gin. What the hell? What the hell was Gene trying to do? Ad lib lyrics. Because he doesn't do it very well. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. But well, I mean, you'll see. There's a. Uh... You know, uh, let me go rock and roll. I mean, let's just, you know, he totally forgot where he was. <laughs> well, he <laughs> started saying rock and roll all night. You know, and he's like looking at Paul, like he's just like, please come and save me. So, um, but uh, it, the only the only reason why I love the encores is because I, I felt like I was seeing stuff that I hadn't seen. You know, the first night I haven't seen those encores like a hundred times, like I've seen the second night. Same thing again with the third night. So. Um, even though Cold Gin isn't my favorite Kiss song, and even though Cold Gin, I think it goes on longer than it should, um, I think this it's a it's a great performance, and it's it's cool it's cool to watch the band walk off stage. And there's much more uh, audience shots uh, during the encores during the second night than there are for the other two nights, and it's cool to see all the follow spots in the crowd and to see an arena full of Kiss. So that stuff is is really really cool to me. Yeah, you, you nailed it second night, and, and that's the one I like the most because of those crowd shots. Mm -hmm. It really gives you a sense of the environment rather than just looking at the group on stage. I can't stand the amount of time it takes them in between songs during the encores. It bothers me because I'm sitting there looking at my watch going, you could have played another song. You could play another song. Yeah. And, and that's my mentality. But going back to the theatrical nature of it, I, I get it. Back then, you hear the crowd rising and stomping and chanting. Um, you know, there really was that theatrical element of, in, of uh, 
you know, incitement and excitement as well. well so, you didn't know you if know. they were coming back or not. You know, no. there was no set list FM to to look at the songs. So um, there was definitely a lot of anticipation and, you know, hoping that they were going to come back and, you know, maybe they're going to come back for one, maybe two. You know, they didn't know that they were coming back for, for three songs. And I say that because, you know, they're the second encore is rock and roll a night. And what do you notice? No guitar smash, no confetti. So. Um, which I thought was interesting because those two things go synonymous with rock and roll all night. So, but they weren't there um, during those performances. So did the crowd, did the crowd think that they were going to get another song after that? Who knows? Was it a, was let me go rock and roll. like a bonus song. They were like, Oh my God, they're back again. And they're going to, they're going to play this song. Their first legitimate jam, you know, was let me go rock and roll during that, uh, during that, during that version. Then, you know, there's all kinds of different changes during Let Me Go Rock and Roll. You know, you're you're seeing the confetti, you're seeing all the the chasing lights that go around the stage. Um, then obviously Paul is smashing that guitar. Hell, in the third night, Paul jumps into the audience during uh, when he, after he's done smashing that guitar. So um, it just it and the, I'm, I'm mentioning all these things together because it it really appears to me that you didn't know that those things were going to happen when you went to the show. It was like, oh my God, I can't believe they did this, or I can't believe they had confetti, or I, I can't believe they, we thought the show was done and they played another song. Like, so the encores, they seem to add a element of excitement, whereas later on in their career, we expected three encores. Yeah, and the, and, and the group themselves are much looser. I mean, there's a camaraderie and a real band kind of feel to them that they're now having fun. They're all warmed up, mm -hmm. you know, from the rest of the show. They're ready to party now, and it's the right time. And Paul, you know, dons a fedora, you know, a, a hat. Um, yeah. He was like, I'm going to save this for I Was Made for Loving You in 1980. So, <laughs> uh, I like second night, you know, for rock and roll all night, it's really where you get to hear way more of Ace vocally and the yes. backgrounds that he brings. Yeah. And that's always a nice touch just to know that he was doing this back then. Uh, but often it's lost in the mix. I, I liked when they came back with all the, the kimono looking things on all the robes. That was to me, that was, oh, and the, yeah. And the, and the goofing around, um, you know, kind of the joshing that's going on when they're wearing those, uh, you know, boxer wardrobe robes mm -hmm. or whatever they were. Um, but what is it? Thir first night's, uh, the award segment in between coach and, yeah. Yes. Yes. That's the first night's the award. The second night is where they have all the, the robes. And then, um, and the third night's just additional joking around. It's cool. I, I like seeing the band joking around and walking around on stage, not playing songs, especially back then, because and I think I mentioned this on an earlier episode that we're watching the band evolve night after night after night after night. So because this is this isn't the same band that, you know, we're going to see or that we watched in Anaheim 1976. There there are much bigger production aspects of the show in Anaheim versus here in Cobalt Hall. So this is this is still a band of you know even though they've had some success but the band is still very green at this time and uh, they're having fun and you're you're getting to see them evolve night after night so that's what makes these early videos to me so interesting that you're seeing the band figure out what works and get into their groove yeah they got a successful album. They've mm -hmm. got a successful single. Uh, Larry, you know, rightfully shouts out that he sold a million copies of alive mm -hmm. and six percent mm -hmm. of those would have been in detroit six percent would have been in detroit <laughs> and who's the guy that that presented the it's larry harris right he's the guy that yeah, larry harris, the awards vice president of the time. Casablanca. Yeah. um you know less than two years ago kiss came to detroit and now they've sold a million records so short and sweet if if just they'd kept any of the on stage uh intermission type stuff that they do later especially 2014 mm -hmm. uh to that sort of brevity makes it much easier to deal with. So here's a question I have for you. Um, and I think I might know the answer aside from Detroit 1976. Did they ever get an, an award on stage ever again? Cause you had them with their gold albums at Madison Square garden in 1998. I was there for that. But are there any other times that you can recall where they got presented with something on stage? 
Um, there's the Kiss Army thing with Bill Starkey, Terre Haute, Indiana, 75. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, but did they glad. ever get like another award on stage? No, I, think, I don't no, recall. Well, I don't. I I don't know. I, I'm not going to say no. I don't yeah. know off the I don't, top of my head. I don't recall. There's certainly no video footage of it. Um, and if it did happen, I'm just not aware of it. But it may not. It may never have happened. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm going to have to. That's a question for the viewers. And, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll wait for someone to, to chime in and correct us. Actually, That's yeah, I, I love that. Effort. Um, but you know, I, I've definitely you know, I mean, you've looked at the history longer than I have, and more in depth than I have. So, just as I was thumbing through the on tour book, I didn't, uh, I didn't notice that there were another night where they got awards on stage. Huh. And then I guess, I guess we could mention as an honorable, oh. night, the People's Choice, where they got Beth. Var- oh, they didn't seven. get. I don't. I don't think it was. I was thinking uh, Var City Stadium, seventy six. So I think they got their gold records backstage. So. Yeah. And then there was that other, I think it was, I have no idea what the date is, but they did get an award backstage where there was those gold tour books that they got, the on-tour tour books. The on-tour, yeah. yeah. That would have been cool to see. But I don't recall. So if somebody knows, and I'm talking about the whole history of the band, aside from New York City 1998 and Detroit 1976, were there any other times where Kiss received an award on stage during the yeah. show? Well, other than 2014, when there were all sorts of people on stage, proclamations, Kiss Day. Yeah, there's some later on. They, well, I mean, so, once they started bringing people up. Well, because there was when they were doing the, there were the the, what was it, Wounded Warriors Foundation. They had, mm-hmm. they were they, they were did doing the check presentations. I'm just talking about was, legitimate. No, there was one where they received a today is Kiss Day. Um, you know, recognizing Kiss Day on stage, mm. some of the mayoral or governor, uh, some states. Mm. Again, I'd have to look it up. It's much easier just to have people tell us. Yes, yeah, tell us. I don't recall that one. But are there any other times that they receive legitimate awards, whether it's gold or platinum albums on stage? Detroit 76, New York City 1998. Tell us in the comments. Final thoughts for Cobalt Hall 1976. Go and watch them. Um, <laughs> like I said, you know, an hour ago, is sitting through all three of these now that we're able to enjoy them all nearly in totality is a really fun afternoon spent with the band on the cusp of greatness, closing out one era and preparing for next, even though there's five months to go, basically, of a live tour. Mm -hmm. Um, It does start changing very rapidly um, after February 1976 when they start bringing in songs from the new album. Um, It it really is a joyous experience to look back on, and I'm glad we've included all three of these in one sitting along with Largo 75 during an earlier episode because they really are fundamentally, you know, two ends of the same story. You know, they're just starting to hit with the live in Largo, Mm -hmm. and here they've now sold a million records, and, you know, they've got their first, you know, proper gold album for a live, which it remains certified to this day, only at that level. Um, <laughs> which clear they've clearly, I mean, it's way more than that. Yeah, it, it's it's got to be. I think I think the number is four million, but that's a, an educated guesstimate based on some internal Casablanca documentation as well from auditing that went on uh, circa nineteen eighty, but. Just going back to the overall thing, again, I I like the history and how it all ties together here of ending one chapter, preparing for another, how Destroyer's in the can, how if you look at the calendar for January 1976, it's just full of so many important moments to uh, that period of KISS that really solidifies them as not only a star band, but a superstar band. Yes, yes. There's a really great interview that was done with Allison Steele that um, it came out during uh, the rock and roll over era because the interviews, they were recorded during January 1977. But she does a really, really good job on documenting the rise of Kiss's stardom, especially at this point in time. So um, it's called 13 Biographies. It's readily available on the bootleg circuit. 
Um, it was on the radio and it was actually produced by, I think, um, was it Nestle T that produced it? Their commercials are still in there. So you can go and find these. It's, it's called 13 biographies, of Alison Steele aired on the radio in, in the seventies. And she does a great job summarizing this time period in history and how the band became superstars during this time. So, um, you know, for me, I've, I've, ingested these shows more than i care to admit and that's not a negative thing it's it's these are this was an important time of, of the band and these are important shows and these were a centerpiece of those early bootleg collections of fans collecting 70s performances so um i'll always go back to night three as looking the best i'll always go back to night two as sounding the best but you really got to enjoy all three of these so take an afternoon after you watch this, of course, and uh, and maybe put on your favorite one again and uh, and enjoy this weird band kiss that we all still love. And we're still talking about nearly, you know, 12 months after the final kiss show. We're still talking about them. So so for now, we'll say goodbye to the inner sanctum and uh, hopefully we'll return soon. If that's if you guys want us to talk about more shows more things more audios and you know hopefully maybe we'll bring on some other people i know one of my favorite episodes this past season was uh, when claudio came on and was talking about his experience of seeing kiss so um this has been a lot of fun this may this may be the last one but it may not be so if people want more we'll uh, we'll come back on and, and talk more about uh, about the band and about these legitimized unlegitimized unsanctioned sanctioned shows so uh so for now this is the inner sanctum